This video is concerning Unit 9, Learning Targets 9 through 13, Skeletal, Muscular, and Integumentary Systems. First, begin talking about the skeletal system. The skeletal system is mostly comprised of your bones and the things that attach to your bones and the things that attach your bones to your muscles. Uh, your skeletal system supports the body, holds it up protects the organs. Consider your rib cage and your skull and your sternum protecting your most important organs. Movement, obviously we don't move without our skeleton. Mineral reserves, your bones uh, are a storage, a large storage of calcium and they, uh, they serve that function over the course of your life. And then blood cell formation, your blood cells are created in your inside your bones in your bone marrow. The skeletal system is divided into two main parts. First is the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton is the middle, think of a straight line from top to bottom. It's the middle of your body, the skull, the rib cage, and the vertebral column, the backbone. And then you have the appendicular skeleton, think of the word appendage that we just learned in the animal unit and appendages like arms and legs, well these are our arms and our legs and our shoulders and our hips represent our appendicular skeleton. Bones have a complex structure, we normally don't wouldn't think of that, but a bone is made up of tiny cells called osteocytes which is uh, osteo means bone, site means cell. And surrounding the bone, every bone has a tough covering around it called the periosteum. Osteum bone, peri around, so this is the covering around their bones. And the haversion canals, which I have written here in perfect handwriting, and haversion canals are where things like nerves and blood vessels come in in order to bring nutrients and to remove, remove waste from the bones. There are two kinds of cells that are uh, involved with breaking bone down and replacing bone. The osteoclasts, uh, with a C, osteoclast, replace or break down old bone and the osteoblasts build new bone. And this is constantly happening in order to recycle your bone tissue. But as someone grows older, the amount of new bone that is being created is much less. And that's why you have something called osteoporosis, which is literally a formation of pores in the bone where your bones get thinner and more brittle. The bone marrow is the middle of the bone, and your bone marrow is made up of yellow marrow, which you see here, which is mostly made up of fat, and your red marrow, and this is uh, where your red blood cells are made, and white blood cells are also created in the bone marrow, as well as platelets, and so your bone marrow is a very important part of your body, obviously, recycling your, your blood cells. Cartilage is something that um, all um, humans have at one level or another. As adults, we have a lot less of it, but as, as infants, we have a whole, our whole skeleton is basically made of cartilage. And cartilage is just a flexible connective tissue that's still hard enough to support, um, you know, say your rib cage. You can see there your ribs are, are largely, uh, or the middle section of your ribs are connected via cartilage. Um, but it's also soft and pliable. Think of your ears and think of your nose. Uh, the, there's cartilage between all of your joints in order to protect the bone there. And some of you have maybe had torn cartilage in a knee or something along those lines. Well, that represents the, the cartilage there that's designed to protect your knees. It's in between all of your backbones as well, your vertebra. And what happens over time is this to infants, 
there's a term called ossification. It's a process in which, whereas the bone starts as mostly cartilage, the bone becomes more and more like bone. It becomes bone. Ossifies means to become bone. And that bone becomes harder and harder over time. And you see here the growth plate. You've probably heard of the growth plate. This is where the bone growth takes place. And eventually that growth plate will completely seal up and stop growing. Several different kinds of joints I want you to be familiar with. Most of them are very descriptive as to what they do. The ball and socket joint is... Uh, literally, one part is a ball and the other part is a socket, and it fits in. You can see that here very, very plainly. And the hip joint is an example of a ball and socket joint, as is the shoulder joint. A hinge joint uh, looks much like a hinge on a door. Um, it can open in only to a certain amount, to a certain point. Your elbow is a perfect example of a hinge joint. Pivot joints, these are joints that um, to pivot means to like spin in place. And so where the two bones of your um, arm, of your forearm meet the elbow, there's an example of a pivot joint there where one of the bones kind of spins around in this area and that allows you to twist your arm without, without any problem. A saddle joint, uh, if you think of a... A saddle where you're sitting on the saddle and you can see that here as I make this example here well there's bones in your wrist that have this same kind of function there on your thumb the reason your thumb has quite a bit of mobility is because of that saddle joint and then lastly are immovable joints and they do what their name suggests they do not move there are several bones that make up your skull, and those bones are put, held together by immovable joints. They don't have any movement in them. Um, some other examples of immovable joints are like your ribs, the ones that connect your ribs to your backbone. Now, ligaments, their function is to hold your bones together. They are uh, connective tissue, and they hold your bones together, bone-to-bone -bone connections. That be helpful, bone-to-bone. -bone. You have several ligaments there in your knee. They're, they're fairly um, popular also uh, in your ankle as well. If you've ever sprained a knee or a ankle, you are actually pulling one of these ligaments, and you can pull them to where they tear. An ACL tear is a fairly common uh, injury in sports, which stands for the anterior cruciate ligament, which you don't have to know. Now, moving on to the muscular system, there's a couple of muscular dudes. And um, muscle system is obviously what we think of when we think of big muscles and that sort of thing, but the muscular system serves other roles as well. There are two main divisions in the muscle system. Our voluntary muscles, this represents our skeletal muscles, the, those that we can think about moving, if that's the way to think about it. And you can voluntarily move those muscles. Whereas your smooth muscles are your involuntary muscles. And then this picture is good because it shows how the muscles are in different uh, patterns in the stomach in order to move the stomach in different ways. And your heart also represents an involuntary muscle in that it moves without you thinking about it. It moves without any uh, mental provocation. Tendons are what connect your bones to your muscles. Your muscles have a, a covering around them and your bones also have a covering around them and those two coverings mix together and you have this tight, um, dense cartilage, or not cartilage, this dense um, connective tissue called a tendon. Uh, a prominent tendon is obviously your Achilles tendon that connects your calf muscles to your heel bone. You have 
other tendons that are in your arms and I mean pretty much everywhere there's a muscle attached to a bone you have a, a tendon. Now neuromuscular junction this is where nerves where your nerve the uh, synaptic terminal of a nerve meets a muscle. And muscles act as motor uh, areas that are moving your brain says move and this your nerve has to send that message well it sends that message all the way to the terminal and there something very similar to what happened when two nerves meet together happens you have a neural transmitter that is released this chemical that is released and in this instance the chemical is called acetylcholine and acetylcholine is released into the uh, synapse here and it binds with these uh, gates and sodium rushes in causes depolarization and the action potential propagates down the actual muscle fiber and you can see that here there's the synapse and, and here's this blue line represents the uh, the propagation of the action potential well it goes until it gets to this area called a T tubule not not necessary that you understand that, but I do want you to know that the action potential hits a special kind of endoplasmic reticulum inside the muscle cell, and then that that causes that one that uh, endoplasmic reticulum to release calcium, and then those calcium ions will go and find your individual muscle fibers and it's there that your muscles actually contract. Now we're not going to get into the ins and outs here necessarily but I do need you to be familiar with these two threads called actin and myosin. Actin is the small thread there with the blue beads on it and myosin is the large uh, thread there with the uh, looks like a some kind of paddle or something there and essentially what's happening is that calcium interacts with the actin and the myosin in order to cause the myosin to kind of pull the actin along and so a, a way to look at this I mean you're going to have several of these myosin filaments And you're going to have several of these actin filaments Let me just make a mess real quick several of these actin filaments and normally when they're relaxed they're out here like this and this represents the inside of a muscle cell and inside your muscle cell I think I've shown you the pictures of all the bands inside a muscle cell but this is what one of those individual units looks like and what happens when that calcium is released the myosin filaments pull the actin filaments towards the middle and that's happening simultaneously on both sides and so what has effectively happened the muscle has become shorter and so that's contraction if you have that happening all up and down the muscle cell the muscle cell will get much shorter and so again understand that the actin myosin filaments pull against one another in order to make the muscle shorter that's simple enough for our purposes and then lastly is the integumentary system the integumentary system is your skin and all of the things that come from your skin things like nails and um, hair and if you're an antelope your horns and all of those things as well and you can see here that the integument is quite complex it's made up of two main layers called the epidermis which is the outermost layer it's the part that you see the part that's showing and your dermis which is the part underneath that and this is where blood vessels and nerves and glands and different things are located here's another picture of the epidermis 
the outer structure of your epidermis is mostly dead cells. And this is to protect your um, skin, protect you from losing too much water, to keep you warm, that sort of thing. And underneath it, you have lots of living cells, and these living cells are um, constantly replicating, constantly um, doing mitosis because you are constantly losing skin cells. And you can see here from this little graph here that the younger cells are at the bottom, the older cells are towards the top. And so as the cells age, they move towards the top. And down here at the bottom, you actually see that these are where your stem cells or some of your stem cells are located and they are creating new cells all the time. Keratin is a substance produced by your um, skin and it is what your nails are made of. And it's what a gazelle's horns are made of. And it's a tough protein type um, structure. Melanocytes are cells that produce a protein called melanin, and melanin is the pigment in pretty much all animals, uh, except for maybe arthropods. Melanin, um, if someone is really dark, they have a lot of melanin. If someone is really light, they have very little melanin, but everyone is colored to one degree or another by this pigment called melanin. And lastly, a little bit about the dermis. The dermis, again, is where the uh, blood vessels are, it's where the nerves are. This is how your skin is nourished. Um, if you've had a deep cut or a deeper kind of cut, you can get into the dermis. Um, it's not very deep. And this is where your um, hair follicles are located. This is also where uh, sweat glands and sebaceous glands are located. The sweat gland is a gland that produces sweat that releases excess water and um, ions into your onto your skin in order to cool you off. And it also protects your body against uh, bacteria. Well, there are also uh, sebaceous glands, and the sebaceous glands um, release an oil-like substance that keeps your skin uh, protected keeps you um, keeps certain things off of your skin as well.